So, without further ado, I would like to invite John Hurstein, Senior VP of Customer Success at Box, and VP of Customer Success, David Ryling from Zuora. Thank you guys, come on. So David Ryling, I'm with uh, Zuora, lead the customer success uh, team there. Zuora, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, about a 600 person uh, company that enables the quote to cash uh, process for any companies who have a recurring revenue stream. So um, we, uh, we enable a lot of the companies that, uh, that you represent and a lot of the companies that we all serve, so. John? Yep, and again, John Hurstein, um, in charge of customer success here at Box. Box, if you don't know us, is a cloud content mon management platform, essentially a place for you to store and collaborate around content, file-based content, typically. And uh, we've been around as a company for, I don't know, 12, 12, 12 years or so, and been public for about two. I'm just gonna lead with a few questions uh, to let them also showcase the differences between the organizations and kind of start the conversation. All right, first question. What does scaling customer success means to you? And if done right, what is the impact you're expecting to see on your orga organization? I mean, you know, at one level, it's just literally scaling from a size perspective. You know, our, our business has grown um, at Box. Uh, when I started the first year I was here, our plan was to book about $20 million in ARR. Um, we've just completed our fiscal year, so I can't tell you the exact number, but our guidance for this past fiscal year was about $400 million in revenue. So pretty significant growth for the business. Um, and obviously part of scaling successfully is growing CS in a way that uh, is appropriate to the growth of the overall business. Um, in, at some periods of your growth, you may want to grow faster than the business as a whole. In other places, you may want to grow slower or in line. And so we're doing that intelligently, I think, is a, a key part of scaling properly. Um, but the other piece that I think is probably more interesting is scaling your capabilities. Um, because at the beginning, for me, when I got here, we had 15 people in customer success. We didn't even call it customer success. And we basically did two things. We did support and we did everything else that came after a sale, right? And um, today, if you look at the team, there are a, a huge number of very specialized skill sets within the team. And so when I think about scaling, I also think about scaling our capabilities. Yeah, and I, I could dovetail right on that. So for, for us, uh, the scaling is, yes, there's a linear aspect to it as your customer base just grows in aggregate number. But for us, it's a lot about addressing the diversity and the variety of customers. So we're, we're maturing in, uh, we, we're, we're moving significantly up market, as many of you are over the years. Um, so we don't want to leave behind the tail of customers we've, we've developed, but the customers that we're moving up into presents a challenge in how you handle those, how you scale to be able to manage those that require higher touch, higher capability, and higher expertise. Um, in addition, our customers are maturing. So not only are we moving up market, they're moving up market as our customers. So for me, the big challenge in scaling is about both uh, aggregate scaling of numbers and scaling your diversity. So dovetailing on the the concept of competencies and capabilities, being able to have a break the paradigm, if you will, of you know one CSM uh, fits all. You know, a CSM is a CSM is a CSM. Being able to manage a team and a function and ultimately deliver for customers across that broad variety of their requirements with your capabilities. That's that scaling and the impact to the company. Um, you know, it, it then begins to grow into what we consider our mission, which is all three: right, retention, growth, and advocacy. So if, we, if we're able to do the scaling properly, we're able to retain that tail and those large number of aggregate customers. We're able to grow those more mature and, uh, and more complex customers and advocate on behalf of all that set. So that's a complex scaling in my book. Can I add one that I forgot? Because that, that was a great list too. Um, ge geographically, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not just, okay, how do I think about you know, multiple time zones and languages and so forth. It's when you move beyond all the people who serve the customer are sitting together physically, you have to think about things like knowledge bases and, and um, methodology and um, systems and process and communication tools and all that, that in a way you don't have to, to do when they're all sitting in the same room. So. Yeah, it's really interesting because what you two are experiencing is something that we have known for many, many years is that as you, know, as you go and interview for different customer success positions and different companies, you'll see that the job description is so different from one company to another and you're thinking, gosh, don't they got it together? Like, don't they know how to define customer success already? <laughs> but the reason is, is that, you know, when you're a startup, the CSM is expected to do everything. And as you grow, you're gonna have more specialized teams. You're gonna segregate and segmentize your account base. And so you'll have 
um, you know, more programs that are very specialized, like all the way to even having partner success programs, right? And then you'll have specific customer success team members that handle just that. And we see that the customer success operations grows as the company grows. So those are natural things that we see all over. Tell us a bit about how your customer success organization is structured. Yeah, so, so we're, uh, we're uh, first, first let me you know, uh, add just a little bit of the description around Zora. So our, our solution is, as I mentioned, is it's an enterprise process enabler for, for a big chunk of the enterprise. It's fairly complex. It touches a lot of uh, a lot of the other aspects of business process within a company. So there's a lot of integration and complexity of deployment. So it's it's not a, a sort of a straightforward, simple deployment or uh, sustainment. So to that end, in our in our company, professional services is actually separate from customer success, and we're we're organized by the prototypical customer success support and training organization under one umbrella. And so for, uh, for us, part of that structure, it, it adds some, some interesting challenges, but also um, the opportunity to kind of segment the customer life cycle in a little bit more um, discreet way. So we actually have to partner with our professional services organization. We have to partner with the sales team upstream in a little more uh, uh, collaborative and collegial uh, model because they're not in our family dis discreetly. So um, our organizations, uh, like John mentioned, we are distributed globally, and so we've got to uh, rise to the challenge of the, of the global distribution of a, just of the team dynamic. <clears throat> We're about 30, a little over 34 people globally that have to do that. We just broke the paradigm on, on moving away from an HQ-centric mindset of our own team um, because of our customers as well not being, uh, distributed, or being distributed globally. So that's kind of our, our structure, and uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear the comparison as to yours. Yeah, so um, we've defined customer success here as basically all the functions that serve a customer post-sale. Um, some organizations put renewals inside customer success. We actually don't. Our renewals team is part of sales, with one exception, which is in EMEA, our customer success leader actually also manages the renewals team. So it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, incubator for, for something there. Um, but we don't have a broader plan to, to do that here. Uh, so what I mean by those post-sale services are uh, consulting, support, which we call user services here. We have a team we call customer advisory, which are uh, the folks that handle our customers who are too small to get a name CSM. And then we obviously have CSMs. We have um, an operations team. Is that a paid program? Um, so the paid offerings that we have today are just our premier services, which is a, um, an up-leveled support offering from our standard business support and consulting services. We don't charge for any of our CSM or customer advisory services today. Um, so yeah, and we can talk more about offerings. Um, operations, I just mentioned. And then one of the things that we've done that I think is kind of interesting is we've, for the last few years, had some kind of a strategy component inside of customer success under different names, where we spend a lot of, a lot, a lot of time sort of analyzing things like, why does churn happen and what do you do about it, right? Or if we've gotten really good at preventing churn, you start turning your attention to expansion and like, what are the conditions that make a customer ripe for expansion and how do you think about that? So we've always had a little bit of like a, strategy slash methodology thing, very small, but How often do you do the these analytics and change the question? Always, yeah. Um, so that's just sort of functionally what we've got covered, and hopefully I kept, captured everything. We're a, a little over 200 people today. We're here, Austin, New York, a bunch of folks in the field um, in North America, and then London, Tokyo, and I'm probably missing something, but that's... That's the team. And I, I just think one of the things important organizationally, and Michael mentioned this is one of the challenges that a lot of CS orgs have, is sort of the seat at the table challenge. Um, I'm very lucky at Box that from the day I joined Box, I've been a member of the executive team. I report to our chief operating officer, and, and we think of it as a key part of kind of the, the functions of the business. And I know everyone's not always that lucky as you start building out customer success, so um, fight for that if you can. Yeah, and on that same thread, so for, for us, um, you know, we have the luxury of, uh, of our CEO um, who, who sort of grew up in the world, whether it was 1997 or 2004, but grew up in the world of, of customer success as it matured. So Teen was at Salesforce from, you know, literally employee number nine. So he, he uh, embodies the fact that he, he gets customer success. A lot of the challenges that Michael mentioned are, are not ones that are on his, his brain. He's, he's much more focused on how do we actually achieve the concepts that he mentioned. Um, one of the things that I do talk about with, with peers and even with some customers who are struggling with what's the, what's the right construct 
uh, or what's the right organizational uh, path is first start with, you know, where is the, either the power base or the financial base associated with the function? Not just the, you know, the hearts and mind, like the logic of why customer success makes sense and, and some of Michael's comments, but, you know, go to the, go to the, you know, the fundamentals, right? If, if, is customer success funded out of a, of a, re a revenue stream? Is it, is it funded out of a special project from the CFO? Uh, is, it, is it part of a, you know, a, a deployment part of the company and they're rolled up there? Is it part of the executive leadership and the executive ethos of the company? Those can tell you a lot about how you may want to not only uh, keep yourself from sort of banging your head against the wall and going a little insane, but also figure out how you might want to design your, your organizational structure today, but also understand where you need to take it based on where the, uh, the buy-in and where the uh, sort of the leadership mentality exists in the company. What are the recent changes you've made to your organization that you think might be beneficial to share with everybody in the audience that really made an impact as you grew your own team and scaled? So timing's interesting because we've just entered our new fiscal year, so we're working through some you know, updates to how we think about the org. Um, probably one of the more interesting things we've done recently, um, pr probably two things. One is we piloted a team this past year that we called Key Accounts. Um, and basically it was a, a set of CSMs that we took out of kind of the mainstream field organization or enterprise CSM organization and focused them on a very selected set of customers specifically for the purposes of driving a higher net retention rate. And we didn't give them a quota in, this, in the traditional sense of saying like we're gonna pay you based on individual transactions, but we basically said what we would expect for these customers to do from a net retention rate if we didn't do anything different than what we do otherwise is X. And what we think we can do with this enhanced level of, of attention, methodology, focus, and, and account ratios that are better um, is actually a net retention rate of X plus something, right? And we basically ran that as an incubator pilot experiment kind of a thing for a year. Um, and then what we're, what we're doing now that that year is up is we're basically taking those learnings and saying now how do we apply that more broadly? What did we learn from that experiment in terms of like how you compensate CSMs, how you measure, how you think about net retention? And it's a pretty big change management thing to think about because you know, many of you are practitioners. There's a big difference between how a CSM views the world and how a salesperson views the world. And, and I don't philosophically want CSMs who think exactly like salespeople, but I want CSMs who have a commercial mindset, that they think about the commercial implications of what, what's happening with the customer. And so thinking that through is kind of a big, a big thing that we've been doing over the last year. The second thing I would say, um, and it's not like a big organizational change um, yet, but is what is the role of customer success with respect to engagement marketing? Right? How do, you, how do you think about reaching your customers at scale, not for the purposes of selling them something, but for the purposes of getting, to, getting them to use the product that they already have in either a, a deeper way, a more sophisticated way, a more valuable way, so that you increase the chances of retention and ultimately expansion? Do you mind if I ask you something about that? Because I think many companies are starting to look at customer marketing or start dabbling with it a little bit. So what kind of customer marketing are you doing now and are you looking to expand that based on your learnings? Um, yeah, so the, the answer to the second question is yes. Um, we are absolutely looking to expand. And, and part of this is the negotiation with, with marketing about who owns what and trying to really get clarity around what is customer engagement marketing and what is customer expansion marketing. And I owe a lot of this to Andy, who's sitting in the middle here, who spent a lot of time thinking that through and trying to be really clear so that we can say to the marketing team, listen, your focus needs to be on these kinds of messages to our customers. Our focus in customer success is on these kinds of messages, right? Then there's a question of well, what tools do you use, right? right? Um, and who's got access to those tools? And what kind of skills do you need? So there's, it, there's a lot of downstream things that you need to figure out once you make that decision that CS should have some role to play. But at Box, you know, we've got 70,000 paying enterprises on our product. We have 70 million plus registered users. It's a pretty big marketing problem to solve just to get your current customers to use your product. Um, and it's a different problem than the marketing team's trying to solve, which is lead gen for sales. So uh, check back with me in a year. David, uh, what are some of the changes you made uh, in the past? Yeah. And that would be applicable for everyone here that you highly recommend trying out. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to share those. So, uh, there's some distinctions uh, between the businesses. You know, I'm thinking to myself, 70,000 plus customers, uh, you know, 800 plus customers. Um, so a very different perspective. You know, business-wise, there's some distinctions that I'd like to carry with you as we, as we answer some of these questions. 
First of all, what I consider sort of a pretty fundamental issue of trying to address both recruiting and development of our team. And so we, you know, we, we've embraced the idea of what the competencies are required for a CSM. You know, it was a challenge because the immediate, uh, the immediate and I'll give you the, the, the answer in the beginning and then talk about it, you know, there's four main areas, operational, technical, business, and strategic, and, and competencies within each of those groups that some CSMs can exhibit uh, many of them, uh, very few can exhibit all of them. There are very few unicorns out there. But what it did do is enable us to be able to determine what the profiles are and then where we uh, can deploy or you know, entice them to, to join the company. Uh, sounds simple, I guess, maybe, but uh, it, it helped us tremendously. It also then invigorated the team a little bit in the sense of where career development and path and their place and uh, get more people in the room to raise their hand when you say customer success professional because it gives it a little more construct and formality to what they do. Another thing we did was, uh, you know, again, not, not necessarily rocket science, but we, we have just, again, we're in the same fiscal year uh, situation as, as John, just finished the alignment to explicit alignment to the rest of the field organization in terms of their segments, uh, what we call franchises of how we go to market so that we have an explicit internal alignment as well as you know, marketing approach, marketing support, uh, technical support, et cetera, uh, for the services organization, for the customer success organization, for the support, if they're, if they're field facing, they have a, a franchise alignment or a segment alignment. Um, again, a, a real game changer internally, um, you know, driving people towards not only the same uh, uh, segment of, of customers, but the same approaches and the same types of behavior in those customer sets. Um, and then I think the third one that we're, we're really, uh, you know, the ink is still wet, uh, much, much like John. There's some things that are, that are in flight today, but we're addressing the edges. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, one, one CSM doesn't fit all. Um, so we also have a, a program much like the customer advisory. A customer advocacy program is, is, is our uh, vernacular, but much the same where we take a pooled approach. We don't have a named CSM. We've implemented that with success over the last year uh, to be able to address the, the, the one to many crowd with a, a different type and level of service, uh, but not abandoning them in the process as we move up market, as I mentioned before. Um, the, core, the core of our CSM function remains, and then uh, the other edge, of course, is at the top. You know, we've instituted something called a customer success partner. So a person of the, the highest level of expertise as well as experience uh, to be able to deploy in a limited number of, of customers where there's either a, a high degree of, of expansion and growth opportunity um, or a, a high degree of uh, complexity uh, as, they, as they sort of uh, grow in their own uh, use of, this, of, the, of the solution. And then finally, uh, you know, introducing the idea of account managers into the customer success organization where they can, as, as John, I like the way you put it, they, you know, I don't want them to be salespeople, but I want them to have a, uh, you know, a component of the, the sales savvy is what I term it. They don't have it in their DNA. They're not driven that way, but they have a sales savvy perspective on, on that process and what it means. They can engage with not only the customer, but internal to the company. They can engage in a, in a, in a selling environment and add value, uh, not break something, uh, and potentially even uh, you know, come up with creative additive uh, components to the process. And so those, you know, we've now got that across uh, sort of the spectrum that I mentioned before, the diversity of customers. We've, we put all those. The last one I mentioned is a pilot, much like uh, you're piloting some of yours. Uh, we're piloting that um, because the, the real question is, it, you know, if the logic holds and those programs make sense, which they are going to in some of your customer segments with some of your CSMs, then the real question in my mind that I'm looking forward to is, how much and, and where do we apply it across the rest of our broad spectrum of CSM and ultimately customers? It's, none of those are a panacea. We are not going to have the advisory group on the strategic, of course, and vice versa. So where and how much do you apply it um, within, the, within the customer segments will be what we're, what we're trying to figure out this year with, with some of the things we're piloting. So. so David, you mentioned you have 800 customers, you're growing the team, and you just align the segmentation basically throughout. Is it just the post sales teams or also the sales teams are aligned sim similarly? It's a great question, yeah, absolutely. So it's both. Um, so the, the, let's call it the, the, the direct sales or, the, or the, uh, the, the, what we would call prospects versus customers. So the prospect selling team, absolutely. In fact, 
you know, we're a very sales-driven uh, company and, and culture within Zora, and that alignment provides infinite uh, benefit for us, frankly. Um, I, you know, I always tell them that it, it benefits them as well, but, but I, I'm more interested in the fact that it was alluded to, I think, by Michael that, um, you know, by having the folks who are working prospects that ultimately become your customers, uh, if you're aligned in the same behaviors, the same cultures, you know the same types of customers, when that, when that sale does move from prospect to customer, and hopefully you don't veto it or kill it, um, you, you're that much more informed about why and what they've bought. You can immediately take up the baton of the customer life cycle and move forward. You, you don't have, for us, we focus on two transition points, you know, sales to services, and services to customer success because our services component is 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 large where our implementations are significant and so if you if you can do everything you can to get alignment in both of those sort of transition points uh, it just allows you to carry that baton forward that much quicker or easier what is your process like for assigning customers to CSMs and how do you measure CSM capacity um, and I think it's one thing to just say all right we'll just segment them based on ARR but then we have to look at the CSM ratio, and then I think the next step is really doing some sort of a staffing model or even a utilization model if some of the team is billable to say, did we give them too much uh, as part of the customer journey that can they even handle that? So can you tell a little bit about how do you assess your strategy and whether or not it makes sense for you and, and handle these kind of questions? From a segmentation perspective, um, first and foremost is, is a decision about whether or not a customer gets a CSM, and that's based on a threshold of how much they purchase from us. We do it based on seats, not dollars, so that's kind of the simple sort of line we draw. Um, there can be cases where a customer who's technically below that line, a salesperson can ask and we can make an exception if there's an upsell opportunity or they need special attention. So that's sort of the first question. Um, then within uh, the, the customer set that's left that, that gets a CSM, the question is what segment are they part of from a sales perspective? So what we've tried to do over the last few years is get CSMs as closely aligned to the sales segment and then ultimately for our larger segments, the geography that they're in, um, so that you are working with a common set of customers geographically, ideally a common set of AEs or account executives so that you're kind of building those relationships. And then ultimately what you want to get to is even vertically specific kind of assignments. We're not really quite there yet. We have like sort of affinity groups, right, where you try and give people, hey, you're doing a lot of healthcare, the next healthcare customer that comes along, assign it that way. So that's sort of the, the theory. Um, you guys know the, the Mike Tyson quote, everyone's got a plan until they get put, punched in the mouth. Is that, you know that you know one? So that's sort of the plan, and then you get punched in the mouth with whatever got sold in a particular quarter that you've got to get assigned out to people, right? So that's when the delicate dance happens between the operations team and the CSM managers around what's current capacity, and ideally this customer would go here, but actually it needs to go here, um, and that's where it gets super messy. Um, so that's sort of on just sort of how we think about assigning. The second piece is capacity, and the way we do it is actually fairly simplistic, which is our headcount budgeting model is just based on a, a pure, simple ratio. So we, we have target ratios per segment of how many customers per CSM, and what we've tried to do in the, the years that I've been here is every year try and make those ratios better for the CSMs and for the customers. So here's a funny thing, when I was interviewing here, this is a true, true story, when I was interviewing here, um, I asked the woman who's running the, the team at the time, client services, that's what we called it, how many customers does each CSM have? And she said, 5,000. And I, I was like, and by the way, I was from a consulting background, right, where you had one customer. I was like, I don't even understand what that means. What does it mean when you have 5,000 customers? Like, what, what, what do you do? Um, and you know the answer to that, right? And so we've chipped away at that over the years by raising the threshold to get a CSM, adding more capacity to the team. So you do all these things. And basically, you're looking at your budget model just trying to make it all work. And I'm happy to say this year, this fiscal year, which we just started, um, we've actually been able to further improve ratios and we'll be kind of rolling that out over the course of the year as we add headcount. So that's kind of how we think about it. 5,000 customers. <laughs> <laughs> for one CSM. You know, the, one of the first things that strikes me is, is um, you know, in the thought process of how you assign customers to CSMs, one of the first things uh, we're, we're trying to introduce is how you assign CSMs to customers. So flip it on its head for a second. Because as I mentioned, you know, we have, um, we have this concept that we're driving home a lot more about the capability and competency of, of the CSMs themselves and where they're targeted 
could be by segment, could be by complexity, or could be by expertise, you know, of, of what type of customer it is and how they're actually utilizing the system. And so one of the first things we try and do is pass that, you know, pass that litmus test. We don't do it on a, you know, when a customer, when we get a new customer, we don't do it at that point. We're, I'm talking about we try and, you know, have a, each manager have a good hold on what their team uh, competency-wise is capable of doing and, and how they, you know, where they excel and where. So, so that's one of the uh, sort of the initial filters, if you will. Then we move into some very similar ones. As I mentioned, geography, you know, we, we just uh, uh, move to the ability to make sure that we have where we can get the CSM closer to the customer, especially when we're talking about the, the, the uh, you know, the one to few and, and the one to very few model so that we can have, we can leverage that intimacy to be able to actually uh, not just speak to the customer, but interact with them and have face-to-face -face and so forth. So geography becomes very important. Uh, it's, still, it's still important with us, even in the advisory or the advocacy group for us, uh, just from the logistics and time zones. So there is a geography aspect. Um, you know, listen, ARR does, does come into it. We, we look at the, the, the capacity aspect of it, um, or at least I'm driving us to try and look at that as more of a, a little bit of a, um, an indicator rather than a predictor. So in other words, when we assemble a portfolio, either for an individual or for a team, uh, we, we try and factor in as many of these things. My, my operations director calls it the smart portfolio, right? So we don't just say it's this much ARR and divide by whatever, heads or, or customers. Um, uh, we, we try and address some of those things I alluded to in terms of the, the inter intelligence behind how you make the choice and then use the ARR as a little bit of a gut check, right? Okay, well, th the good news is we decided that, you know, we've got the capability and competency in this particular CSM. Uh, they're in the right region and they've only got four other customers. That's great. We're going to sign them. And then we look at the ARR and it's, you know, 400 million or whatever it is. And we're like, okay, well, so we got to go through the cycle again. So we go back and try and... Um, uh, apply that smart portfolio um, perspective. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like that's the way we do everything. Certainly, uh, we, we do have it on mass approaches as we get further down the customer segmentation cycle into the SMB style customers. And there it's a little bit more of a numbers game and, and, and very similar to the, the optimization trying to, you know, play the headcount ratio game every year. So it's a little bit of both those practices. Can I just add just one thing? And I, like my dream, and if if any of you can figure this out, I encourage you to try. I, I never figured it out. What would be really cool is if you could look at a bunch of things you know about a customer and assign some sort of score to the customer based on the likely effort that they're going to require from you for them to be successful, right? Um, like I'm not kidding. Like if you could actually figure out, like based on what we learned in the pre-sales cycle, this one's going to be highly yeah. complex. It's an uneducated admin. They don't really understand the product. Versus someone like, oh, they implemented Box at their previous company. This is a relatively simple deployment. And if you could figure out what those factors are and assign like a weight mm -hmm. to the customer, and then say each each CSM has a certain capacity, right? Now you could actually be really intelligent about saying I'm only going to give a CSM en you know enough weight to fill their capacity. Um, but I, I don't know I don't know how to do that. The client nightmare index. Something <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Well, so yeah. what's it, what would be even even more ideal is to have the client actually hand you that when they become a customer. <laughs> exactly. Just tell so you. Here's exactly here's a, how much. Here's what a pain in the ass be. I'm likely to be. Yeah. Uh, the question was sort of how do we come up with a CS budget? I think now for me, uh, well, I think for anyone who's got a multifunctional CS organization, it's complicated because for me, the way we budget for Brandon's team, which is our premier services team versus our consulting team versus our CSM team is completely different, right? Um, for if I think about CSM specifically, the answer is there is absolutely zero magic to it um, in the sense that when I got here, we had a team of a certain size and we had, a, we had certain assumptions about account ratios at the time. I consistently argued for the last almost six years that we need to make those ratios better and better and better. And so I basically consistently argue for more budget, right? But there's not a top-down formula that says for every dollar of ARR, you can have X, you know, X cents of, of dollars for CS. I think that the, the, what we spend relative to what we cover from a revenue perspective has been relatively consistent over the years, but I've never been given that top-down, like this is what you have. We don't treat it like a cost center is the way I would think about it. Now, I will say, I will tell you one other trick um, that I would talk to you about over coffee yesterday. Um, if you can figure out how, how to do this in your company, I would strongly recommend it, okay? I am responsible for the churn number at Box, okay? And you can imagine in a, in a revenue run rate of $400 million, our churn number, even though we're very good at customer retention, is, is tens of millions of dollars. Um, 
the, the financial team every year as they're planning for the next fiscal year basically figures out what our churn dollar, our churn rate and churn dollars will look like for the next fiscal year. That becomes our baseline assumption, right? If I can go back to finance and commit to a lower churn target than what they have in the baseline plan, I can get incremental resources, right? So what I've been able to do over the last few years is say, well, if you give me this much more in terms of either CSMs or enablement heads or programmatic dollars or what have you, I will agree to accept a lower churn target as my personal target for the company, and that's worked um, really, really well. And uh, do we miss churn targets at Box? No. Um, so hit your numbers, build a track record, and then use that as leverage to say, I will commit to better results with incremental investment. We do have a little bit more of the sort of, I guess, direct or pedestrian approach. There is a percentage of ARR that we apply as a, as a budgetary starting point or, or planning point, I should say. Um, that, 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 you know, the percentage itself is, is up for much debate, as you can imagine, as to what's appropriate. There's industry, there's industry standards for that. Um, they vary pretty widely based on the segment and and uh, solution, uh, the actual software solution itself, but there are some standards you can draw on and look at from size of company and segmentation. So we do start there. Um, I did I did listen to, to John yesterday. That was a great nugget on, on sort of uh, gaming the, the churn number. Uh, in fact, I actually today literally was uh, speaking with our FP&A guy and, and used a little bit of that as uh, uh, maybe game it the other way and sort of talk to him about what the target should be and then later on I'll tell him what I think yeah, we can exactly. do. Same result, but uh, the, the other thing we're also trying to leverage there though uh, in a similar manner is is to say, okay, well, what if we are, you know, let's say the churn is a zero-sum game, we tell you what we're going to do and we hit it. Uh, what could we do on the growth side? So if, if we deliver on the growth side, if we are able to tie uh, to our upsell and to our expansion uh, as a company in concert with the sales team, in concert with the inside sales team, whomever is in, in the landscape of driving sales. But if we can demonstrate our ability to affect that number, then then let's do some horse trading on that. You know, wh what does that do in terms of additional resources or headcount for our team? So working the top end of the equation along with exactly what, what John said of, of working the churn or the retention side of the equation are ways that you know, you take sort of the budget that you're handed or that's, uh, that's handed down um, and, and then try and manipulate it if you can through your performance, your team's performance at, uh, at both ends. What would you recommend our best practices to implement a customer success initiative to just scale the customer success team in today's corporate world? <laughs> I mean, I guess... It invest in systems and process. If you really, if, if really what you're solving for is scale, and one, here's another sort of trick that I learned, um, and Seton has left, but Seton, who was sitting here a few minutes ago, was our first CS ops person. And one of the things I learned through Seton, who's awesome, is when you take a bunch of really annoying work that's spread out across a bunch of people, and you give it to one person, that person will fix it. If you don't do that, then it never really gets fixed, right? So what, what, what I mean by that is when I inherited this team, when I took on this team, we had eight or so what we used to call client service associates, CSMs today. They did a whole bunch of really nasty, administrative, processy stuff that they really shouldn't have been doing. And it was largely just because we grew so quickly and there were no systems in process, and so we just did it manually, and somehow it wound up on the plates of the CSMs. And, but you know, for each one of them, it might be an annoying two or three hours a week of their time. No one was super motivated to fix it, right? Well, if you, if you hire one person and you say, take all of those two to three hour annoying pieces of work and give them to one person, and you have to find a really special person who's willing to take that job, um, take it away from the CSMs, give them that time back to spend with customers, right? And then that person will say, shit, I don't want to be doing this stuff all week, right? And they, if they've the, got, got the right mindset, they will start to think about, well, how do I automate this? or what system could I use, or, or in, importantly, what other function in the company should actually own this problem, right? We were doing a bunch of back-end billing work, for example, um, like revenue-related stuff. So, so a trick that I learned is if you, if you can take little slices of people's time that are really inefficient, give them to one motivated person, they will fix it for you. Um, and that will help you scale. So that's just one Great advice. fun one. Yeah, I, you know, I think something comes to my mind. So I, I come from a, a consulting background, uh, like John, uh, a couple of decades in, in that world, and all the all the optimization and best practice approaches. Uh, by the way, I started when I was five years old. So, 
You look great. Yeah, thank you. So um, that world's all about optimization, right? And so finding those best practices and, and some of the things that, that I, you know, I picked up there are, are translatable. So, so if, you, if you focus on trying to have um, a modularization or, or a, even just a, a gathering of the definition of what it is you actually can do. So, um, you know, begin to put together a module of capability. For instance, it might be, um, you know, optimization workshops that you can conduct for, for customers. And being able to put a little bit, just a little bit of, of definition and almost, you know, approaching marketing, um, uh, you know, descriptions of those so that you can, rather than saying, okay, I've got to figure out how to do a best practice of a customer life cycle from the day they sign to the day they, you know, retire, you can start to, to chunk it up a little bit. So think about, you know, if you've got customers who are in the stage of a life cycle who are struggling with just simply the adoption of features and capabilities of the product, nothing else, no change management across the company, no buy-in, et cetera, then have a, an ability to have at least an 80% definition of, hey, there's a set of things that we can do. Here's maybe a playbook or a description or a set of tasks uh, assigned to that particular module that we can deploy in those customers. Then you can, similarly, you can kind of take the people in the organization and rally them around that type of work. That's not the only thing they're gonna do, but you can take a slice of not necessarily in this case the repetitive stuff, but the specific stuff that allows them to maybe they're really good at diagnosing that that uh, adoption stuff, but they get they get hung up when they're trying to map a business process um, to to the solution. So you you focus them on that. So think about modularizing, and then rallying the people and and ultimately even the customers around it. The other potential impact is that um, if that's done well and done uh, to a pretty mature level, you can begin to leverage that up even further upstream, even in the sales cycle. You can begin to, to, to acquaint customers with the fact that, uh, okay, you know, knowing your kind of business and how you're going to be using our solution, um, you know, it's not going to be a big deal for you to figure out, you know, this, this uh, particular challenge in, your, uh, in the uh, implementation of the solution. But it is going to be a challenge for you to figure out, as I said, for instance, feature adoption. Um, so we've got an offering for that, and our CSMs are capable and versed and repeated in being able to do that. So it actually begins to affect the sales cycle for your, for your friends who are trying to win customers. So. You know, we all have kids, or some of us have kids, I know I have one that likes to grow tall really quickly. So this summer, she was actually shorter than me, and I'm only five foot two, so that's not a big accomplishment, but she actually outgrew me, and she's now five foot six. That's less than six months. And I think some people in the room have sort of like the same experience with their own company growing really quickly. Like all of a sudden in six months or within a very short period of time, there's a slew of customers that come in and you're like, wait a minute, right? So did your company go through that kind of phase? And if so, how did your customer success team handle that? Do you have any lessons learned that you can share? Um, yeah, we, for sure, um, you know, again, we went from 150 employees when I joined almost six years ago to we're about 1,400 today. CS went from 15 people to 215. So, yeah, and our customer base grew pretty massively, again, not just in terms of scale, but also value, right? So for us, a big customer when I started was about a $50,000 customer, and there were, there were a handful of those. And today, there would be a handful of, you know, multi-million dollar customers. So. So it's all gotten bigger. Um, you know, you just you sort of try and keep up. Um, you try and solve for the long term, not just the problem you have right in front of you. If you if you expect to continue to grow at that kind of pace, like if you think it's just sort of a short term spurt, then just do what you need to do. If you think this is going to be a sustained kind of high growth thing, then make sure that you and your team are thinking about not just the problem you have right now, but what that problem is going to look like when you have. We we have a term at Box 10 exit. Like, what is this problem going to look like when we are 10x the size or the scale, the complexity that we are today, and try and solve for that? And you can't always do that because you can't always make that big of a forward investment in things like systems and process and that kind of thing, but at least kind of have that mindset that you're thinking about it that way. Um, and then just, I mean, I don't know, just have a great company that people want to come work at because you're going to have to be hiring like crazy. So do that. If you're running into this issue, start creating more optimized business processes that would ideally help not only the specific problem you have right now, but also think about two, three years down the road. So build the scale. Try. I mean, it's really hard, right? And you're always going to find yourself, every once in a while, you're going to take, you're going to go, holy crap, like we cannot, we cannot continue to do what we're doing now. Stuff's going to break. And at some point you just have to, well, every once in a while, stop, 
go fix some stuff and then restart again. You can never completely stop, but just try and think ahead as much as you can. David, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I have two kids as well, um, late teens, so if anybody would like one. <laughs> um, so again, contrasting, uh, you know, the, the companies themselves, right? Us, us versus uh, versus Box. Our growth, um, to me, um, you know, and some of you won't be struggling with this, but some of you will understand what I'm saying. So growth comes in many many fashions or many many. Uh, don't don't let the growth um, that's represented by a very large complex customer pass you by. So one of the challenges that we try and embrace is the idea that when we when we have some of these very large enterprise customers who've got not only multiple business units, multiple geographies, certainly multiple product lines and so forth. Uh, these, are, these are like countries in themselves. They're, they're corporations, they're truly conglomerates. So the, the challenge of being able to help grow in that manner, what I mean by don't let it pass you by is uh, don't make the mistake of thinking because you have that big logo customer have, you know, they're on your logo board that you put up at the, at the, uh, the marketing events and at whatever. So, don't assume that that means you've now got the the uh, sort of the cachet throughout that throughout that landscape. Think of it as individual customers, right? The, those divisions are individual champions, individual buyers, individual users, individual um, uh, people or groups that have disparate you know solution requirements, this disparate use cases, adoption uh, people, everything. So so it, it, you know it, it's an important point to realize that. Uh, you know, don't don't declare victory once you've got the logo on the wall. Treat it as a yes, a self-contained, but a, a still a series of customers that you've got to go then scale and win and figure out what the scalable components are within that. You'll have some nice leg up things because you do have some commonalities of them having the same logo on the building, perhaps, but treat it as a, a series of challenges within that for your for your growth scalability. Non-related to customer success scaling, how do you incentivize the customer success team uh, to really boost morale? Free uh, coconut water and candy. That's how we do it at Box. Because um, I, I don't know if I truly know the answer, but I think part of it lies in the career development piece and how people think about career. And Michael talked about this before. You know, there's a lot of people who aren't sure yet whether they think of customer success as the career that they want to pursue. Um, for those that do, you want to make sure you're, you're a great place for them to learn how to do customer success really well and to develop their skills. And for us, it started with, you know, again, when our customers were really small, we could hire people right out of college and put them on customers right away. It's really hard for us to do that now when we sign General Electric, right? So we have a lot of progression just built into our customer base now because we can start people with smaller customers and as they grow in their skills and experience and maturity, you know, we can kind of bring them up, you know, into our, our larger customer segments, more strategic customers, and that kind of thing. But there's also people who think, like, I'm not convinced I want to be a CSM for the rest of my life, or I even want to be in customer success. And so what we've made a real point of here is a focus around career mobility that is both inside of customer success and then also outside of customer success. So we, um, and you guys can tell me if I'm lying, but we, we make it a point. Um, to support people in customer success after a reasonable amount of time in the current job in pursuing opportunities, mostly inside a box, right, um, in other functions. And so today, um, you know, we have alumni from CS who are in um, uh, basically every function of the company, probably except for legal, honestly. So product, marketing, sales, engineering, um, tech ops, et cetera. And we also obviously encourage movement in the other direction. So. Brandon Savage, who's sitting in the front row here, was one of our product managers, longtime product manager, who's now managing one of our service teams. So you want it to go both directions. But I think the problem we're primarily trying to solve is people in CS who are like, yeah, I, I kind of, I'm intrigued by product. I want to go do product stuff. It's like, great, do a great job here for us in customer success, and they will, we will support you when those opportunities open up in other functions. And I'd say on a quarterly basis today, we probably have somewhere <laughs> between seven and 10 people who sort of move from a CS role into another role in the company. It's kind of like a 5% of the team. And career mobility, spot on, absolutely. I mean, I, that's something that, that I'm personally really invested in trying to develop for us. At, at Zora, we're a little further down the, or further up the, the, the development cycle there. So we're putting, trying to put that in place to make it clear that there are paths. Um, in addition to that, though, I, I think you know, one of the things we try and tap into, uh, not necessarily uh, from a, an, an incentive per se, but from the boost morale and, and, and so forth is 
you know, at the end of the day, customer success really is embodied around you know the empathetic service of providing success, success to someone. Hopefully, you know, obviously, customers. So tapping into that, um, we've we've tried to get a better idea of what it means for customer people in the customer success function to feel recognized, and to understand that people have some idea of what they're achieving, and the fact that they are pouring themselves, you know, empathetically into this effort to achieve something, and then capitalizing that and saying, okay, let's see if we can get the rest of the company to make sure that they understand that this type of recognition is really what feeds the beast and, and the aspect of, of what we think we're being successful at. So that's one aspect. The other one is to try and identify similarly inside of a customer, similar things. And, and that one's a little, frankly, ironically, probably a little easier uh, to be able to go to customers themselves and kind of go back you know, around and behind CSMs themselves and figure out how customers describe and recognize what's what's transpired and then have them vocalize that, obviously share it with a wider audience with, with the folks that have de delivered it themselves. So it's a big morale boost to be able to say that you've, uh, you know, you've, you've really achieved the vision, right? You've, six, you've, you've defined something of success for the customer and then have your peers, have the rest of the company be able to not just recognize but then herald that throughout the, the, the rest of the, the company. So we're just going to do a couple more questions. All right, so the first question is, customer success starts with onboarding. So what kind of tips, what kind of changes have you made to onboarding? What kind of tips do you think is are like absolute musts to create a strong onboarding so that the customer success can actually take it on from there? Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, you know, a couple of fundamentals. One is, uh, you know, start as early as possible. Uh, I think Michael alluded to this, right? It is, you know, yes, many times we're constrained to not be able to sort of even know about <laughs> or, or at least touch a customer until they've, they've crossed that, that boundary into us. But try where possible to gain as much uh, knowledge and insight and even participation in the, with the customer upstream up the customer life cycle. So if you're able to go as far up and can afford it into the customer, uh, sorry, into the selling process. Uh, again, it, it, it gets back to that whole idea of that transition, you know, that baton then is handed up that much easier. So push your team and yourself and your funding and your business model as far up the customer life cycle as, as you possibly can as to where you get either knowledgeable or engaged. Um, David, can you share one playbook from customer success where Kind of give an, an exact example of how did you push that upstream specifically? Yeah, so we we actually track something um, called areas of complexity in terms of solution. So uh, you know, again, there, there's a, a good bit of complexity in how we um, have to implement and customize and integrate to, to achieve the solution through uh, services engagement. But that surfaces within the selling process, and the sales engineers themselves are the ones who sort of are, are the ones who identify those, and they are required in the selling process. They're required to document those so that everyone can consume them in the selling process, and they, they'll know how to win, right? But, but what we've done is push ourselves up into that selling process, or at least to look over the fence, gather those areas of complexities, we call them, these very defined, could be product gaps, could be customer process gaps, et cetera, go and find those, and sort of take them off in our corner and consume them and make sure we fully understand and vet what they are and begin to think about, well, this customer's coming our way. These AOCs are not all going to be addressed in the selling process, God knows. So how do we begin to think about how we'd inherit those and then begin to manage and operate and not necessarily always mitigate, just simply take on and, and go. So that, that uh, sort of uh, grabbing that from the front end and pulling it into our midst, even if we're not part of that process, holding on to it, knowing that when it comes our way, we've already seen it. And John, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you the second question just to be respectful of everybody's time. And also, because I know Box has so much data that you can analyze. So I'm dying to hear, uh, you know, how do you uh, look at churn? I mean, churn, like the question says, is a great metric, but by definition, it's trailing. So how do you um, uncover leading indicators to churn, and uh, what do you do to best predict it? Churn is a trailing metric. It's not very useful when you're trying to figure out what you should do, right, with your customers. Um, it kind of tells you what maybe you did or didn't do, you know, in the year before. So uh, I think the, 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 um, the, the problematic answer is it depends a lot on your product, right? So 
for us, what matters a lot is user adoption. Um, and as a counterexample, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, my last job was at NetSuite, which is an ERP solution. The problem at NetSuite was never user adoption, because if you were in accounting and the, and the company decided to use NetSuite for their ERP, you used NetSuite, right? The, the adoption was 100%, right? right? So the way they thought about churn was very different than the way I need to think about churn or churn risk, right? So we think a lot about adoption. So are the users who purchase seats actually using the seats on a regular basis? Um, that's probably the most simplistic thing, and there's a few different ways to kind of measure that. Um, what's really important, uh, and I assume most of you are in SaaS, is you need to make sure you're working with your product team to make sure the proper things are instrumented in the product so that you know the answers to these questions, right? So it's one thing to say, like, does the, does the user log in to the product? That may not be the thing. Nick Meta from Gainsight actually had a, a quote that I love, which was, no one ever bought your product so that they could log into it, right? right? So, so the question is, what is it about your product that's interesting for the user that adds value to the user's you know, business day, per, or if it's consumer, you know, for a consumer? Um, what is that thing, and are you measuring it, right? That's the thing you need to latch onto from a customer success perspective and understand it. It might not be one thing, right? And so that's the first piece is just adoption or activity of, on the product. What we got smart about a couple of years ago was this also this notion of sophistication, which is don't just tell me how frequently the, the user did something, but how interesting is the usage? Are they using more advanced features or the really basic features? And in Box's case, it's like if I store a file in Box and I look at the file, that's great, it's usage. But it's more interesting if I'm collaborating with another person on the file and we're commenting back and forth on the file and I'm editing and uploading new versions of the file. That's a lot more interesting, right? So you start looking at the sophistication of usage. Now, the hard part for us is trying to do a regression and say, how do you correlate those things with what actually happened from a churn perspective, right? Um, because it may be that you have a customer with really high adoption that churns. Well, maybe they got acquired by Oracle, which is like a number one leading churn indicator for us. Is a company if Oracle buys a company, they they're no longer a customer of ours. Um, do you guys know this? Yeah. If you sell software to a company that gets acquired by Oracle, they will not be a customer a year from that day. Okay, um, because Oracle doesn't buy software from other people. Okay, just okay. Pay attention. I'm not kidding. So it's possible you could have great adoption and still have churn, and it's also possible you could have kind of crappy adoption, or what you think is crappy adoption, adoption from, but from the customer perspective, it's enough adoption for them to make an ROI on their investment. So you could have low adoption and not have churn. So teasing that out is really, really hard, um, certainly for us with the complexity of our customer base. And so the, that was a really long answer. The short answer is it just depends on your product, the users of your product, and the value your customers get from your product. And what you have to do is try and figure out how do you instrument something that gets as close to the way the customer values your product as possible? That's likely to be your best churn indicator or risk indicator.